Okay, there we go. Um, so for anyone worried that they may not be able to catch all of the live stream, no worries. We have, um, uh, you know, we're going to have a recording up on both Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, and uh, yeah, it'll be there forever. So you can watch it as often as you like. So uh, well, let's see. Let's, let's, I guess, get going. So. This is exciting because we've been wanting to show Gaia 1-2 for such a long time, um, especially the past month or two. We've just been packing so many features and it's uh, these are things that are best shown, not talked about. So this is going to be perfect. So let's just start with the startup screen. And so as you can see, it's a, a cleaner startup experience. Um, uh, mo most of the elements remain the same. It's just nicer to look at. You can quickly get around things and there are going to be a few new options coming in soon. Uh, so we'll just go ahead and start a new project so you can see the updated interface. There we go. Okay, so this is Gaia 1.2. This is, I should also say, this is a nightly build. This is not what everyone's going to get tomorrow. This is actually... Um, the the build that I was just working on. So there may be a couple of little tiny bugs, but nothing big. Um, we redesigned the interface slightly. It's it's you know at first it may look like there are a few new things, but it's not that different. Uh, first of all, we have a new redesigned viewport, and I'll go into that in a second. Uh, we also have a new um, viewport toolbar. So everything that you need while working is. Um, immediately available. Uh, so you have your lighting settings, um, which now include um, atmospheric options. Uh, and then you can uh, quickly turn the 2D viewport on and off. Now this one is um, more useful than it has ever been. And it's something you might want to have around all the time. Uh, and of course, when you don't want it, you can just um, collapse it. We also have a new grid in the viewport. Uh, but more importantly, the viewport itself is uh, uh, something new that we built from the ground up and will give you better visual fidelity when working with height fields. Um, it actually runs our own custom render engine uh, made exclusively for uh, height fields. Now, you'll see the toolbox looks a bit different. Usually, this is what it would look like, and also it would be much larger. It would probably be something like this. And I should turn it. There you go. There's everything that we have right now. Uh, we have a new option. It's called most used nodes. So it'll show you the stuff that you use the most. And Gaia learns from how you use um, uh, 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 the different nodes and how you connect them and all. And so it then starts showing you what's more relevant for you. And of course, you can just switch this anytime and then have access to everything. Also, when things are not visible here, you can always search for them. And there are a couple of ways you can search. Uh, so if you just hit tab, you can search for anything uh, that's not visible. Like right now, I don't have fluvial erosion here. But I can just type in fluvial and it uh, comes up and I can just create it. Another way, uh, my preferred way is actually to drag out a line from a port and then type in whatever you want, hit enter, and it'll create that. Uh, one of the big things that we have is um, caching. We actually rewrote the caching engine. We have, uh, uh, what do you call it, like a, like a persistent cache. So this is more like um, a session cache where you can just get going the next time you open a file without having to wait for Gaia to reprocess all the existing nodes. And so um, there's the new baking menu. It's available here all the time. And when you open it, you get to, of course, uh, you know, do a hard bake on any nodes if you want. But you can also just check cache graph on close. So when this is um, turned on, when you save something, so I'll just save this. I'll just go temp. And if I go new file, oh, it was too quick for you to see, but there is a dialog here saying it's going to cache everything. And so next time you go and open it, it reloads that cache and you're just ready to go immediately. And it works for all resolutions. So that's gonna be um, a time saver, especially when working with very large graphs and it like 
you know, 2K resolution or something where it takes, uh, you know, several moments for you to get going just to have the graph load back up. Now you're seeing here, uh, this is a, a, a new edition. This is the, the infinity graph. And the idea of the infinity graph is to help you break down your terrains into, or rather your terrain graph into more manageable um, little nuggets. And so I'm just gonna create a new one here. I'm just gonna call this um, color production. And so now this is a whole new graph, but it is kind of part of the same terrain. And I can get access to other things from here. And so what I wanna do is I wanna take this and just do a little um, you know, texture and sat map. So I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna create, um, I'm, just, uh, I'm just gonna right click and create a texture node from the suggestions. And then from there, I'm gonna create, um, oops, let's see, there we go. I'm gonna create a sat maps node, but they're not connected to anything and I need a connection here. So for this, we use the new portals 2.0 feature. And unlike the previous uh, portal nodes, which were kind of clunky, um, here, all you have to do is I drag out the line from um, the erosions uh, main output and just select make portal. And so now this, you'll see it's marked as a portal. So if I go here and I drag a line out, there's a portals list. It's even showing me what graph it's coming from. And so I can select erosion output and it's now connected um, wirelessly, so to speak. And then I have this going on. And so that's how the infinity graph works. It allows you to break things down into smaller pieces. And then that way you can be more organized than by using simple graphs. It also encourages you, it encourages you to plan a bit better. And um, trust me, if you're working on large productions, um, having this kind of planning will help. And I'll show you a bit more when I break down the ice train to show you what kind of planning went into that. But sometimes, of course, you know, you don't know what's going to happen in your um, in your graph and then you have to adapt um, accordingly. So let's say I'm done with all this and now I wanna add snow and I wanna um, mix that with my sat maps later. So what I'm gonna do is uh, just, uh, just I'll just create, um, let's see, just a snow. So we just have snow. I'm gonna make sure I connect that to the erosion output. So that's done. And so now I have uh, the snow coming out. Here's a new um, feature that we just added yesterday. So to combine the snow and sat maps or any two output um, ports, I can just drag the snow um, and touch the sat maps. It just creates a combiner for me. I'm gonna switch that to 100% max. Uh, there's a lot of snow, I need less snow. And, oops. Something's not right. Oop, I connected the wrong thing. The new combiner, um, it takes the first input and then treats the other input like the same. So for example, this was coming from uh, there. Um, the snow output is a height field or a mask, and this is color. So it was then forcing the color, which was the secondary input as a mask. So it was turning it black and white. So instead I swapped them around. And so there you go. So now we get this. Now let's assume this was a whole complex process. And so what I want to do is I want to make a new, um, like a, a, a infinity tab uh, for this. So I'm just going to select these two and I'm going to go to the uh, graph menu and go move selected nodes to new graph. And I'm going to call this um, snow production. And there you go. You get it um, in, a, in its own graph and then it created all the appropriate uh, ports or portals for what you needed. This looks a bit weird because there are just two floating nodes here, but if it's a larger graph, as we'll get into shortly, you'll see there's, there's a, a, a great flexibility in having these be very separate. So, uh, you know, there are lots of uh, different things happening in individual nodes. Um, unfortunately, we don't have too much time to get into that. Uh, but let's see uh, what, uh, you know, how I use the infinity graph and a bunch of other Gaia 1-2 tools to create the 
the glacier image. So I'm going to open up this file. And this one's um, 2K. And it's, it's made of a lot of different nodes. But you can see it loaded immediately. And this is showing me a 2K because the, the session cache just loaded uh, loaded it straight from memory or straight from um, straight from files and it's now in RAM and it's ready to go so uh, I broke down the entire process into a few different pieces and so I'll take you through them one by one and this didn't happen um, you know but uh, uh, with a lot of planning I kind of knew that I would have the basic terrain and the color production would be separate, but then the ice and glacier, they took on a life of its own. And then I just created them straight where I had them in the construction tab and then just moved everything to, uh, uh, to their own tabs. So anyways, uh, let's take a look at the basic construction first. So, uh, the core shape itself is, not that much. Uh, you can see it here. There's like you know not that many nodes. Uh, I personally like to avoid um, filters and um, like adjustments as much as I can, like clamp and um, auto level and things like that. I try to use very few of them, and when I can, I will use the um, the post process track uh, stack down here in all the individual nodes. You can see you have all these helpful things here. So it has slope noise. And that slope noise was made like diagonal. So um, you can see the default uh, settings for any node are a bit muted. So you can see what are the things that I've actually changed. And so one of the big things here was like changing the direction. So it's diagonal and then using clipping so that um, you can take away the bottom and some of the top of the, of the slope and just have it be this um, large chunk. And this would become basically the, the you know the side of a mountain. So uh, once you have that, it's a bit of folding, and folding then created this shape. Looks pretty cool. Uh, I love these giant slabs. They're great to work with, especially with erosion. And that's obviously the next step. So you can see there's a fair bit of erosion going on. You can see lots of down cutting, uh, and there is, uh, there's you know no inhibition. I didn't want too much sediment being created. I wanted to preserve most of the rocky outcrops uh, as much as possible. And then we have a second erosion. Again, I love doing multiple erosion. Um, it's just, it's great. Uh, now here, you can see this is a bit different. You can see this is very rocky. And that's because of the random sedimentation. That's a, a, a new expanded feature in Gaia 1.2. And so at higher values, it creates a lot of um, uh, loose debris that flows down the slopes. And it works best with you know nice slopes. And so here, to give it lots of nice um, momentum without overpowering the terrain, uh, I had this uh, lockdown. So I have selective processing. And I'm using the area effect for precipitation amount and the bias type was altitude. Uh, I'm just covering the top 4%. So that means this little bit here, that's all that gets the, uh, the erosion process going, like the precipitation that uh, makes the erosion process work. So then everything flows down. So the bottom part remains largely untouched by actual direct erosion, but gets like the secondary erosion from debris flowing down and so forth. And that is kind of the base. There's really not much to it. Um, and because it's not that featureful, I wanted to have like a, a, a large rock outcrop. And so to create that, I had a mountain. And then I used fractal terraces, which is a new node that we're shipping uh, in Gaia 1.2. So you can see it's creating these beautiful um, fractal terraces. And then I used recurve to make it look a bit more windswept. And then finally, uh, a lot of folding to make it look like this. Then erosion, of course, to make it look more realistic. And then transform it down into a smaller chunk. There's also a bit of clipping going on because I didn't want a lot of the, the, the ground area. I just wanted it on a flat um, surface so I could just uh, combine it. 
with the previous and so that's happening like this so combined this is what the two uh, terrains look like there's a seam here and normally I would try to do something about it like possibly have the erosion happen after I combine but we're gonna get a glacier and we're gonna get snow and all that stuff's going to cover this up so I'm not too worried about it but normally yes if if it if you're gonna have uh, a terrain that's gonna be barren and the seam's gonna be visible then I would say you know do a bit of erosion afterwards maybe even mask this part out and do a bit of erosion or something like that so anyways uh then we take the the previous erosion i'm gonna get get the angle from it like so and then i'm gonna use that to feed the snowfall so in the snowfall node uh we have uh the snow production happening but i also have use snowfall mask and so because of that uh, we have a slightly angled snowfall occurring, so we don't get it like too evenly everywhere. Uh, it's actually powered by this. At the same time, I also have um, a slightly high adhered snow mass, so snow sticks a bit. But at the same time, there's a lower um, slip angle, so it kind of slips down on the slopes as well. Um, these were not really exactly planned. I kind of experimented to see what works i wanted to have a lot of snow but i also wanted it to have a clear snow, uh, snow line so we have water down here and didn't want the snow touching the water uh and then a little bit of melt because i had high intensity and that was creating giant mounds of snow which i didn't really want and so i melted it um so you at this point you might ask why would you want to melt it just lower the intensity but that actually doesn't look as good because you, uh, when you do, uh, you know, snowfall and settle and melt, and these are like complex processes that um, interact with each other, and that creates a better looking snow than you would otherwise. Uh, I think. Uh, let's see. Is something wrong with the feed? There we go. I think uh, Facebook is giving me a bit of trouble. Um, is everyone still seeing everything okay? Just want to make sure that I'm not talking to myself. I hope this is a lag and I am not really talking to myself. Although it wouldn't be the first time, that's for sure. Oh, good. Works. Okay, so now back to your regularly scheduled program. So we have snow. We have nice-looking snow. Um, here's an example. You can see... Um, ooh, you see me doing that? Q and E now let you go up and down in the viewport. Um, it's long been on our, on our list. I know some of you have been wanting it for a long time. It's there now, finally. So you can see this angled... Um, uh, snow accumulation that is a byproduct of having uh, you know the kind of settings the balance settings that we have here and that you couldn't get just by lowering intensity this is by having lots of intensity so you have lots of snowfall which then settles and thaws and melts down a bit and then the rest of the the physics that we do here and so that's what we're um, you know that we're that's what we're basically counting on to make this look uh, uh, pretty cool and very natural so that's our snow and we're kind of done um i should mention another tiny advantage in gaia 1 2 is you can see i am on the snow node and i haven't done anything specific yet i can see the snow separately so that's a built-in filter now so whenever you work with the snow node you get this view where the terrain appears dark gray the snow appears white you don't have to switch into any special um preview mode in the 2d view or you don't have to set up a a quick color or clutter node and this will hopefully save you a bit of time similar thing happens with the lake node so the lake node is pretty new and i love this it was one of my favorite things to do in gaia now um, if you don't really have that big of a, a complex terrain otherwise this would create so many nice lakes everywhere you can see there's a few puddles up here um, but i don't really worry about them too much i mean you can you can exclude them 
uh, by creating a mask, but I wasn't too worried about that. Main thing I wanted was this larger water body. And just like the snow, you can see this is um, coloring it differently uh, without any special setup. And this is the last part in the actual construction of the terrain. So beyond what um, so-called superficial things that we'll add, um, this is all that the construction entails. Now you'll see I have lots of ports going out. Uh, so I have a raw terrain port going out. This is a, an auto level node, but I unticked everything. So it's just kind of like a dummy node in a way. And I just have this here so I can identify it um, better um, with the portals. I didn't want it coming out from a combine. I have way too many combines right now. And so this doesn't, if you do this, it doesn't really cost you too much. So feel free to do that. Um, so, okay, so once I had this, I wanted to get the basic color production going. And uh, let's see what that looks like. This is a small bug where I changed the graph. It just goes away somewhere far off. Uh, that'll be fixed before we get this to you, so no worries about that. So let's see. Okay, this is, um, we're going to take it piece by piece because this looks weird, but it's actually not that complex because the basic color production for the terrain is just this. I am not too fussy about how I texture terrains because really in real life textures for ground um, like our terrains aren't that detailed, especially the farther you go away, you want to have some um, variation. But again, I, I, I don't want to go too crazy on that. So I just have a simple texture node. Um, defaults as usual. It goes to a sat map. Um, this wasn't default. I had to go look for this a bit. And uh, by the way, you now have favorites here. Yay, you can right click, add it to favorites, click favorites, you just see the favorites. So no more having to hunt for the things you like or having to remember these numbers. So that would be good. Um, there's a, a, a not enough detail because the um, because of the, the height ranges and everything from the texture map coming in, it was only processing this much. So I turned on jitter just to get a bit of crinkliness in here. Uh, in the preview, you're now seeing the final result. So that's why you're seeing this glacier come in and the snow or the ice here. So don't worry about that. We'll come back to that. Um, in fact, for now, I will lock it down to just our lake. Um, so I like to change the pin for color as I move around because you want it to be relevant to what you're working on. So there we go. Here you can see the effect of how this is coming in. And so add the snow. I'm just using a quick color node to convert the, the mask into a, a, a color map. Although with the new combiner, you don't have to do this. Actually, when I started, we didn't have that. And so I used the mixer and now I just have this here. Um, either way, it doesn't matter. And so that's your ground and your snow. And then the second part is taking the lake depth, which looks like this. So the lake node will give you an outline uh, for the lake. It'll also give you the depth and it'll give you a shoreline mask. So I'm just gonna use the depth here uh, and I'm blurring it just a little bit. And then I am displacing it to create this pattern. Then using recurve and shaper. So there's shapers now built in. Uh, and so I'm really using it to make this lean and just focus on the, mo the densest pieces here. Uh, so we get this, displace it again, because why not? Hey, if you displace it once and it looks good, it'll look even better when you displace it twice, right? And there's a blur here. I have no idea why. I was probably doing something with it. I should have deleted it, but I haven't. Uh, I'll leave this here just in case I remember like, what it was for. And then we make the water. This is a very simple gradient. You, again, don't go overboard with colors. I just, you know, I like to keep it very simple. And then uh, combine that using the lake absolute output, which is. Um, we'll see it's uh, I just took a height uh, thing with the lakes output and then uh, I'm sure it's basically this it's this again built a long time ago before we had more conveniences in the in the node now you could just uh, take the the lake outlines and you're done so anyways 
that's what I'm using to basically mask out these two um, different color maps. And then uh, we'll come back here when we have the ice. So this is it. This is all we have to do to get the basic terrain, whatever we created in the construction part, that's what we uh, need uh, to color it. So that's done. Now we move on to the ice. This is one of the more weirder things I've built. It doesn't look that weird, but conceptually it's weird. And the reason I actually started um, making this was actually this was a prototype. I wanted to follow a, a basic procedure to see what we could create with uh, snow and ice. We actually have, um, you can see we have a glacier and iceberg and ice flow nodes that are currently in production. Um, they're not going to be in 1.2. They'll probably make it to 1.3 or 1.4. Uh, but sometimes to kind of follow an idea, um, it's easier to just do it in nodes. And even though I don't get the exact results that I could get in code, I can follow this to kind of like explore ideas and then turn that into algorithms later on and so on. So anyways, um, what's really fun is that Gaia is powerful enough that you can take something uh, as complex as the ice flow that I, that I created and be able to build that with um, what's already in the toolkit. So first of all, uh, this is how we start. I took a clamp node in extend mode to get this hard mask. Now, ignore everything that happens with the terrain. We don't care because we're going to, in the end, when we're done with everything else, we're going to mask out with the lake mask and that's all we're going to care about. So what I needed was the ice sheets that would be here stuck to the, um, the coastline. And so uh, using this extend mode clamp, we get that mask. Then I took that mask and used three different cell nodes to create these different uh, fragmented maps and then combine them together using max mode. And so we get this uh, even more complex outline than what a single cell node would give us. Then you use rocks. Uh, which in mask mode basically just acts as like a, a, a control jitter. And so it creates this, which then I use aperture to expand it. And I use the octagon kernel. So it's now octagonal pieces right here. And so we keep that to the side and then we combine a couple of cracks. Uh, best seen here. I'll turn off the, the 3D just there. This is what the crack looks like. There's another crack. Combine the two, we have lots of cracks, crack squared. And then displace it there. This, I, if I'm not mistaken, this is how they did the the water for quick one. Remember that like, it had like, I don't know, eight frames or something, eight, 16 frames that would just keep looping. That was the water, it's kind of like that. Um, anyways, turn this back on. So we have, this being combined with the previous one, which actually gives us this. This is our a smaller crack map, if you will. Then we bring back the lake depth, which is this, and then using um, equalization here, and then gain and clamp and displacement to, to get like that top level of the, the shoreline. Just that. Well, not just the shoreline, but a bit more of the depth. And here, instead of using it as depth, I'm actually using it to get uh, like a, a, a distance field, almost. So we take that, uh, and that acts as our mask. So then we can bring in the lake absolute, which is the outline of the lake, and what we've just created, and we get this. And so that's our ice mask. Now, at the same time, we're gonna take this ice mask output and we're gonna make a massive Voronoi, which has also been clipped. So we get shapes like this, clamp it down, and then we get a Voronoi plus, also clamped down. You can see it's tightly clamped, it's just 1%. This should be like tallest buildings. But we get this, we combine the two, and we get this, and this is our floating ice sheet. And so then we can combine everything, 
that's what it looks like. These should be connected better. They're just floating bits because I, I was working with portals and trying to organize this. Uh, so it doesn't matter, but like this is coming in from the lake thing elsewhere. This is straight from here. And this is our final terrain and ice. And so that's done. And then let's switch back to color production so you can see what we do with that. Uh, so we have the final ice output here. So it's this, it's literally this, it's just a quick color. I had these two shades. And uh, again, mask and mix, and that's it. Uh, like I said, I try to shy, I shy away from the, the complex color maps. It doesn't really give that much output in the end. So our ice is done. Now all we need is a glacier. And so for the glacier, this is the one where it got a bit weird. I won't lie. This was really out there experimental stuff. Uh, so first of all, I have a mask node where I'm just using the terrain and ice output from the ice tab. And I just made this mask. This is what I wanted my glacier to be. And then I fed that to the snowfall port, or the, uh, yeah, the snowfall port of the snowfall node. And you can see I have very unrealistic settings. So a lot of duration, a lot of intensity, a lot of settle and thaw, and uh, minimal slip off and adhered snow mass. I just wanted this to pour down like yogurt, right? This is not snow. This is by no means snow. It is just a, a soft, like, you know, marshmallowy gooey thing coming down. That's going to give me a good mask. That's all I'm looking for, a good mask. And so we take the uh, take the the snow output and we'll use that to create our mask. Now I'm feeding this into Apex because I wanted softer edges. If you don't want softer edges, then you can skip it. But uh, you can see how the edges are tapering off. That's basically what I needed. And then I displaced it a bit because I didn't want it to be that straight uh, shape. There's a bit of flow going on now. It's I wanted to feel like it was actually uh, moving. Now this becomes our central point for masking everything. And uh, that's all we have to do as far as the mask goes. So then we go back to the snowfall, we take this output, and then we erode the hell out of it. You can see I have very high random sedimentation going on, uh, and the precipitation amount is masked. Um, that's the area effect, it's masked, and I'm using the the mask from before to drive that. Uh, I'm not too worried about what happens to the surrounding area because I'm going to merge this with the main terrain using the snow mask later on. So I don't have to worry about what happens to any of this as long as my uh, glacier part looks okay. So we get lots of debris and we stratify it. So we get this um, pattern going on. So you can see there's breakage here. There's some nice flow down here. Uh, this is masked. Then we do a bit of recurve. Recurve is so that it doesn't look so systematic and um, square cut. And then we um, create some cracks. Uh, again, I'll show you in 2D. So look at that, that's a lot of displacement. So I used the displacement stuff down here. And then uh, uh, the rest was just the basic cracks node. I think we had, oh yeah, I changed the, uh, the X and Y scale setting so that we would have slightly longer um, crack uh, pieces. Uh, I don't know what the unit of a crack is. And I'm trying very hard not to make jokes about hard drugs. So we take this, displace it, it creates this almost curling pattern. And then we combine, uh, we use combine to extract or subtract this out from our main um, glacier system. And then it starts creating these beautiful cracks which resemble um, what happens when, you know, glaciers flow down. Uh, this could be a bit more systematic, but because of the angles I was working in, it didn't really matter. So I didn't go any extra lengths to, to modify that. And then uh, we take that, I added a bit of combine. Um, you know, I just use max mode and very little ratio. Um, this is what my Berlin looks like. It, it's auto level, so it's just spiky. 
that's really all I wanted. You can see it's like high octaves, small scale, bit of extra warp frequency just so it would create a tumultuous pattern. So like this. Um, and then we merge it, uh, like I said, max with this. So what happens is um, we take this slightly smooth looking bar and then we add a random element to it. So it's now creating these poking chunks. Um, and then we erode it again. So there you can see there's stuff happening. Uh, you know, again, I'm using the altitude masking, the area effect. So it's only happening on the top part, lots of random sedimentation. And then from there, we do a bit of color stuff here. But before we do the color stuff, we'll just take the erosion output and combine it with the main turing. So that's it. I'm using the mask that, uh, there we go this mask to merge it back to the main terrain, the terrain and ice that we get from the ice tab. And then because this looks too much part of the mountain slope and this is a glacier, it should be a bit higher up. I'm going to combine this back and I'm going to actually combine this with, as you can see, the actual mask itself. So it's using the mask to raise itself up. I mean, I'm doing this in screen mode, just 2%, it's fine. Uh, I know it's connected the other way around, but I also have swap inputs. So this one goes up, the other one goes down. Um, anyways, so with that, the glacier gets its own um, volume. And that is the end of the terrain graph. The rest is just color production. So for that, uh, we go back to the erosion output. And then I'm going to use a rock map, which is a new thing and it created this uh, map for us. And then another is the occlusion map. Now the rock map gives us this um, ice uh, color map. So it looks really nice and icy. While the occlusion gives us a dirt map. Uh, this could have been better, but you know, I didn't, again, didn't spend too much time on this because the glacier was only, only gonna be visible from a couple of angles for what I was doing. Uh, so anyways, uh, take that and mix the two together and we have dirty ice. Then we mix it with, uh, another element that we haven't gone to, which is the fake shine. So I'll go to that. But anyways, we mix it and our terrain is done. So the fake shine, which was just a little icing on top. Um, that's almost a bun in this case. So when we have this terrain, actually, I should go and uh, pin this for color so we can actually see the real result. There's the real result. So this is the fake shine. Now, obviously, we are not creating a realistic render engine for environments here. We just need a render engine that lets you create and examine uh, uh, your asset. But in this case, I wanted a bit of, you know, whether it's shine or floating ice, whatever it looks like to you. I wanted to add a bit of that. And so to do that, we go back to the color production. This is just like a, an add-on. So when we get to um, this output here, the ice and the other thing that's masked, take a constant node, um, zero height, and then you create a purlin that's like this. So you can see I have a bit of clipping and a bit of displacement. Uh, somewhat high scale, but also very high uh, frequency. So it creates this pattern. And then we use this as a mask for the nose, uh, the noise, the nose filter. We don't have a nose filter, I don't think. We do have a noise filter. And I am passing the Perlin as a mask to that. Now, it's not visible here, but if I were to go turn on the advanced or mo enhanced mode, you can see this is the pattern that's being created for us. It's actually very minute, it's barely visible. Then when we pass it to the quick color, we get this and we use another mixer and we add it on top of this. And so we get a little bit of um, shine or floating ice chunks or whatever you like. And so that's what we get here. And then finally, I'm passing this to a light node. So this is the light node. It lets you bake. Let's see. Oh, 
Facebook did a little blip there. Um, I think we're still on. So anyways, uh, the light node lets you select all sorts of uh, lighting preferences, including atmospheric uh, options. Uh, this is going to be a reworked a bit before you get it. This is one of my um, internal versions, so things are a bit mm, unorganized. Um, anyways, you can choose lots of things like air density, um, haze, the um, thickness of the ozone layer, and you can choose the sun direction. You can have shadows and ambient occlusion, and all of that gets baked into your color map. So I'm giving it the height from this, um, our final piece, and then the final color, and it's producing this color map which i can export and uh, if i don't need um uh, dynamic lighting on my terrain uh in 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 my dcc app or in game engine then this will save you a few render cycles and actually will render much faster since you don't have to do all those extra things so anyways let's take a look at our terrain and um Okay, there you go. There's our tray. So basically, once you break it down, we made the terrain separately. We use the mask of the lake and the depth of the lake to create two different ice sheets, one that's whole and one that's broken. Uh, and we used the depth to decide where those pieces go, but at the same time displaced it so it's not too even. So you get like the cracks going all the way down here. And... Um, also out here but then not here and then for the glacier we just used snow we eroded the snow um, did a little bit of filtering on it added some cracks gave it a little bit of lift combined it back and voila so as you'll see one of your best friends uh, is a mask and uh, uh, just by separating the elements and keeping them in different um, tabs, I was able to experiment a bit more. And also because this is baked, I can just, or cached, sorry, I can quickly go back and forth and load this again and just continue wherever I was. And that's it, it's, um, it's not that hard to create this. And I hope some of you go and start creating something like this, because I'd love to see what you guys can, can do with this overall technique. Now based on this in the near future we will have new glacier tools and everything um they may not exactly use this kind of processing we'll we of course try to use more physical processes and um uh, uh, algorithms that mimic nature uh, more closely uh, but these are the kind of results that you can expect and have tools that will let you just go like paint a glacier and you'll get a glacier and just go ice flow and you can choose a depth and that's where the cracked ice will appear and so on so anyways and i hope this gives you a better idea of what you can do with gaia and also a glimpse into the kind of stuff you're thinking of in the future uh, i have not been reading any of the comments because like part of me was scared that this might crash but it's not i'm just used to being scared that this will crash because 1.2 was a massive overhaul. Like, you wouldn't believe the kind of things that we have done. Um, if you know what GitHub is, we had 1,600 commits just for 1.2. We had so much going on. We overhauled um, quite a few things, and we made sure we did it in a way that for you, it, it, it'll be transparent. You won't know what we changed if we changed something under the hood. Uh, and... Uh, 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 but it's it's more powerful, it's more stable. Uh, I built all of this in Gaia 1.2, so it was kind of like a dog fooding experiment. I wanted to be sure that this could withstand a, a more complex scene, especially at 2K. So this whole thing was built at 2K. And so, um, yeah, a couple of minor things I want to also draw attention to is... Uh, so down here, you'll see the status bar has a couple of new things. There's the cache size. So this is telling you that there's 4.8 GB of baked cache in the, in the cache folder. And you can set that in the preferences of where that is and how much you want to allow. Uh, if it's getting too much, you can click this and go clear like everything or stuff that's older than a week or do it manually. And this is mainly just the session cache. So it just helps you load a file faster. It's not going to compromise your file or anything like that. If, uh, 
uh, you know, just uh, uh, if you end up just accidentally clearing all or intentionally clearing all. Another one is the memory use button. Uh, we've improved this quite a bit. So right now it says 8.8 .8 gigs are used. This is RAM for this um, scene that we're working on. Now we have a passive optimizer. So if you don't touch a node for a while, um, it'll kind of unload it from memory. It'll give you a faster experience. But then at the same time, if you're working on complex things and you don't want to wait for Gaia to catch up to what you're doing, you can just open this manually and I can just say, oh, just dump the viewport cache. And let's see how much it saves us. There you go, 5.6 GB freed. And so our th uh, thing is down from eight gigs to 3.3 gigs. And that's how easy it is to save on memory and optimize your workflow. Uh, Another thing, this is tiny, this is not exactly a new feature in um, uh, uh, in Gaia, but it's if you wanna organize your graph as you work, like here's a really handy thing. So if I select this and if I um, press Shift E, all of the ancestor nodes are selected, so I can then just organize my graph like this. Or if I just press E without the Shift, it selects all the descendant nodes, and then I can organize it like this. So as you go along, if you wanna just move little bits and pieces or uh, branches, that's a great way to go about doing it. Um, okay, I'm gonna go back to the chat window because I haven't seen anything you guys have been saying. Maybe you've just been screaming at me to stop that you're bored and you don't wanna see anymore. Um, hopefully not. Um, Oh, let's see. Okay, Jason's asking, can you show the cartography? Oh, that's right, the cartography node. Okay, so I'm going to go to a new file. I want to save this. Um, let's make a new um, uh, mountainous terrain because those are the coolest. I'm just going to make a range node. That's what it does. It's going to have it be a bit taller and have a bit more definition. And then I'm going to switch to expert mode where... I don't need categories. I know where everything is. So, and then I also have most used turn on. So these are all my favorite nodes. So, okay, on top of the range, I'm gonna add erosion. And so with erosion, uh, let's see, I'm gonna do area, altitude, uh, like 89 or 90%, so something like this. I'm gonna increase the duration and I'm gonna increase the Preview resolution. So let's see, there it's giving us a, a nice terrain. I'm gonna reduce the inhibition. Um, actually, I'm gonna take away the inhibition completely. I'm gonna add a bit of random sedimentation and apply. Ooh, too much random sedimentation. Undo, there we go, just a little bit. Uh, I forgot that's good for a big slope like the one we were just working with, not for a, a large scene like that. Too much random sedimentation can ruin uh, a large scale, um, not so tall terrain. So anyways, this is pretty nice. Um, I'm just gonna add a lake node to it. It's not necessary, but I like having a bit of water on these terrains, it just looks cool. So anyways, I'll put this to the side, or no, we need this. Uh, because we're going to create the cartography node from this. So drag it out and go there. You can see suggested. Like this is how much I've been using lakes in cartography. It's the number one suggested node. And so there, just um, attach the two and we have our map. I'm going to open the 2D window because it looks even better in 2D. This is meant for 2D. Uh, so there you go. These are all your options. You can choose to have different kinds of uh, contours. Like you can choose, of course, how many contours. Like I'm gonna go and have like lots. So you can see there, there's lots. I'll just reset it back to five and it'll create sub contours as well. Like I have grid lines on right now. I can turn it off so we can just see the contours. And I can even turn off the 3D shading. There you go, that's our uh that's our cartography output but it's even better with this on um there's no water here so you have to turn on water oops i haven't connected the water duh duh so you take the depth from the water uh or the lakes node and you feed it to the second port and there's your water and so by default it just gives you an outline and um if you go process water 
that'll give you the depth for the uh, for the lakes as well and you can have like the you can also choose the number of contours you want for the water that's separate from the main um, landmass uh, you can also choose to have a smooth um, land or water gradient and then like if you wanted to just hide the the contours I'll just um, use zero um, intensity but it actually looks nicer with so we'll bring them back and then uh, oh I took away the grid I'll bring that back too so there we have a grid and there we go if you want to make things a bit thicker you can choose the pixel size for different things like you can see the boundary between the water and the landmass that is a bit thicker um, but you can choose how we want it to be if I make it one you can see it becomes thinner um, you can choose the different colors for the contours and then you can choose different colors for the um, the entire map you have um, three different ones for water and 17 for land so let's say if I go to um, I'm gonna put um, like an auto level in between these two so I'm just gonna drag and shift drop on this so it just makes it really tall but I'm gonna go and click G here so it uses this for shading uh, that's basically pin for color if you don't know and so there now it's using a different type of coloration because I can just change how this works with uh, 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 like the height so I'm just giving it a different height eventually we'll have different color options here and a lot more uh, but as I've, I've just said before this is like this node is so much fun it's a rabbit hole if I it just work on this like the rest of the team will not get me back for months on end so I had to pull myself back uh, and so just think of this as as version 0.8 we're gonna keep adding more stuff uh, and there is the cartography node now one other thing you can do uh, I'm just gonna do a quick job of it um, to show you but it'll give you an idea of what more you can do so I'm gonna take the flow output from the erosion node and I'll use a shaper so I can fatten this up and that's your um, river network and so I'm gonna combine these two Oops, I need to use 100% max for this. And actually, um, the lake output needs to be auto leveled. I forgot about that. In fact, I think I'll just go for equalize just so I get a bit more oomph to it. And I'll use shaper again because we're just going to do a quick and dirty job. So, okay, we have this. And then we combine the two and we get this. Now, um, I'm gonna clamp, there's a bug right now, so uh, let me reduce the shaper. There we go, something like this. Combine the two, and we get this. And then if I feed that into the water, oh, that's another tiny bug that we have here, I think. I'll have to clamp this out. Ah. It's like I said, I'm working with a nightly build and I was playing with something, so it's creating this. I have to clamp this out. Actually, auto level and clamp, and we might get some of it back. Nope. Uh, what well, if this had worked, you would have gotten rivers along with this. You can see that's happening. It's just overpowering the, the previous thing, so I'm just gonna bypass these two. I'm um, not sure if auto level will work that well here. Ah, uh, but that's it. Oh, I should have pulled the main build from the uh, from the server. That would have worked. What I'll do is I'll make a, a a proper version of this and I'll post that online. And in fact, like you know, we're gonna have this out tomorrow, so you can play with it yourself, and I'll have a sample file in it or something. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's it. You have uh. You know, a lot of uh, uh, interesting new tools to play with. And um, so let me get this back to just depth. There we go. That looks nice. So, yeah, just imagine what the reverse here would look like. By the time we get to uh, cartography 1.0, uh, and again, this is just a bleeding edge, so we'll have a, a, a few opportunities between now and the final release to, um, you know, maybe sneak in a few features and improve all the little bugs and whatnot. 
and uh, yeah, you'll have a lot of fun playing with this, hopefully. So I think that's it. Um, if anyone has any questions, now would be the time. Uh, just going to look at uh, some of the comments here and Marco saying, stop adding features. I'll never be able to master it. Well, that's the challenge. You have to master it as fast as we add new features. It's this is this is like we're crazy people. We're not gonna stop adding features. We're gonna, in fact, we're gonna double the amount of features that we add all the time. I mean, look at this. This is just point two. We added so many things. Imagine what point three will be like, or point four, or point five, or ooh, what's two point oh gonna be like? And I should I should not talk about that. That's all NDA. Um so yeah uh you know gaia 1.2 i mean seriously we're all so excited for you guys to try it out and um uh, we're eager to hear um your feedback on everything and um oh i just realized i forgot to show you one of the interesting new changes uh, which is the build tab so your build system is right here you don't have to open up a dialogue anymore all the options are here and here and the terrain definition is now down here so you have easier access to it you don't have to open it up in a pop-up and so when you select a node for output uh, you get them here you can now even sort them uh, you can change the different format you know um, uh, in case you haven't heard uh, you know you finally uh, uh, fixed the EXR bug so you can now have really clean pure 32-bit output in EXR uh, so you have all, all these options you can also choose which ports you want to export and not export so let's say you just want to have the primary only like erosion you don't need all the extra maps so you can just say primary only or manually tick what you want and rest of it is pretty much what was in the build manager um, you have a few extra options here if you open up the, the build button drop down and then just click start build and you're ready to go so that's it. Thank you guys so much for uh, joining us. And uh, again, super excited to get this to you so you can play with it and um, give us your feedback and we'll have uh, Gaia 1.2 production ready in no time. And as usual, thank you so much for your support. Um, you know, we're really grateful for all the feedback you guys give us and all the ideas and, and uh, all the fantastic artwork you guys have been posting. You have no idea how, how happy that makes us to see you guys create beautiful things with Gaia. So keep it coming and uh, uh, see you on the group.